Cyberpunk 2077 was released on the 10th of December 2020. Just as many others, I too was very excited for this game. But sadly it quickly became clear that it had been released in an unfinished state. It was full of bugs, many of which game breaking. And while some people did report that they were able to complete the game without any issues, I was not ready to put my patience to the test. Especially considering the fact that I'm a completionist at heart, so things such as broken side quests bother me a lot. This is why I decided to wait, and wait I did. It took CDPR two whole years to finally patch out all the bugs, but with plenty of other titles available I had no problems waiting. Three weeks ago I started playing Cyberpunk 2077 and 93 hours later I can tell you what I think of it. First, let's talk about the ultrawide support, which is native here. No need for any fixes, however, it does suffer from the sickness which seems to plague most titles with native ultrawide support, namely that the closer an object is to the edge of the screen, the more stretched it appears. This issue is common in such games and I'm able to get used to it quite quickly, although I would love to see it taken care of at some point. The problem here is that the game has camera angles which are designed to simulate the way real life cameras and even our vision works. In other words, this phenomenon is not just in games. Even your eyes experiences with your peripheral vision, although your brain does a great job at fixing the distortion for you. Anyway, ultra wide monitors take this to the extreme, especially if you play at 32 by 9 like I do, which is why this issue is more obvious here. I would love to see it fixed in games, not everything has to be realistic. The second problem is the minimap. It is rather small and quite far in the upper right corner, especially when playing again in 32x9. As a consequence of this, I realized that I had to frequently turn my head in order to check the navigation on the minimap, otherwise I would often miss a turn. This too became less and less of a problem as the hours passed. At this point, I have to also wonder if I simply got better at navigating the map since I had been driving in Night City so much, or if it simply became easier for me to check the minimap without feeling so disturbed by it simply because I had done it so many times. It's hard to tell, but it is an issue that I've noticed at the beginning. With those things out of the way, let's talk about the actual game. Cyberpunk starts with us making our character and selecting a life path for him or her. We get to choose between Nomad, Street Kit and Corpo. This choice determines our introductory missions, but also gives us special speech options during various encounters later on. My first playthrough was as a Corpo, which in my opinion is the best choice for V, particularly because of the many Corpo speech options throughout the game, but also because it somehow makes a lot more sense for our protagonist in my opinion. He's someone who wants to reach the top of the city, his ambition motivates him to climb the corporate ladder until he's betrayed and forcefully terminated from his job as well as stripped of all his perks. That doesn't break him however, so he then chooses to become a legend by being a mercenary instead. One way or another, his ambition guides him to greatness. In addition to all of that, one of the endings is very focused on going the corporal path, so if you are a corporal you're gonna have a lot more special speech options based on that. So in my opinion, that is why V as a corporal guy makes the most sense, but it's again my personal taste. The life path you choose also determines which introduction will be offered to you as explained. But in my opinion those missions are too few and way too short. It takes less than half an hour to finish them and reach the main game. This makes it difficult to get attached to the character's past and why he would do the things he does later on. Cyberpunk could have kept you within your life path story for a few hours instead, giving you a real feeling of who V and his friends are. And while the rest of the game does this so much better, the start is important because it has to hook the player. I remember my first few hours of Cyberpunk were mostly mediocre. Obviously getting the player hooked within the first hour of a game which is designed to be played for 80 plus hours is no easy task, but I feel like the life paths could have been the way to do it had there been more depth to them. I did mention that the game is now in a finished state. That doesn't mean that there are no bugs however, some will still occur but nothing game breaking. For example, there are these moments in the game where our character's vision becomes distorted since his implants are malfunctioning. It's supposed to apparently only last for a few seconds, but in my case I played for over half an hour with it, before thinking that I had to apparently somehow have my optical implant repaired, but since the game did not tell me anything specific on the topic, I ended up googling it and realizing that this was a bug and a simple restart would fix it. In fact, that was the case with pretty much all bugs that I encountered. Another time my scanner vision simply would not work so I restarted and it was fixed. 
These bugs were nothing terrible and since the game offers you a quick save feature, no progress was lost at any point. You can quick save after the bug has occurred and when you load the bug will not be there so it's not like you have to load something before the bug happens. One thing that broke my immersion a bit was the fact that nobody seems to mind if you just take their stuff. This is an RPG, so you will be looting tons of stuff. It was just funny how I enter places and politely steal everything that is not bolted to the ground, even during some really emotional moments of the story. The other characters are absolutely cool with it, nobody says anything. The next issue I had with the game was the most minor one of the bunch, but I feel like it has to be addressed. The dystopian future of Cyberpunk 2077 is heavily sexualized. Wherever you look you are met with sexy ads about anything and everything. And I love that. I thought it was very fitting for a place such as Night City, I mean even the name says it, come on. However, I quickly figure out that there are almost no hookers in the game. I think there are a total of 3 prostitutes you can actually pay for sex. That seems really odd given the world presented before us. They have various places which offer you virtual reality sexy time, but since normal prostitution is still legal and clearly exists, I wonder why there is so little of it. I mean Night City is essentially a mega city in this world, okay? and three prostitutes are the, are the entire supply of the whole city. I don't know about you guys, but I think these prostitutes are gonna be working a lot. During one of the scenes, I saw a guy who asked at a virtual reality place if they also happened to have old-fashioned real prostitutes. And the woman at the entrance simply told him that that is not the case, it's not on the menu, and he looked really disappointed, he expressed it too. So I was thinking to myself, okay, you know, even the game is kind of addressing the fact that there aren't that many prostitutes, what's going on? Well, it never gets explained, it's just weird to me, it's probably just a thing that they didn't want to do because the three prostitutes which you can find, they all have their unique sex animations, so it's different, slightly different stuff happening, so I suspect that they just didn't want to make like a bunch of places with literally the same animations playing out with a slightly different model. That's the only explanation I have, but I, I think it's just immersion breaking. Finally, I wish to complain about the fact that you effectively only have one serious love interest in the story. Not only that, but she's a nomad, which matters when it comes to the game's endings. Generally, I would have wished for a few more options. She's not a bad character, but at the same time was neither my type nor was the ending which is related to her one that really appeals to me. As you know I don't do spoilers so I can't really say more and since we're talking about love interests let's also discuss the game's wokeness levels. Oh you no know, I'd say they're not terrible but I'm only saying that since it's a cyberpunk game and in a future which is so dystopian and heavily sexualized you can't really apply real world logic too much. Still, the game has a bunch of gay characters, in fact, you get as many gay options out there as you get heterosexual ones, and that is not because every character can be both things, but rather you get specific characters, so all characters are divided to either gay or heterosexual, and there's an equal amount of both. But what really did annoy me was that one mission in which you have to assist the bartender of a club with some races. And when I say races, I'm talking about, you know, racing against other racers in cars. That bartender looks and sounds like a woman, but of course it ends up being a transvestite. His car has the rainbow flag on the inside as well as on the outside so that no matter what camera angle you choose to use while driving during these races, you are going to see it and be reminded that you are now on Team Transvestite. And of course to top things off, he even insists on telling you about his transition. It's all very woke and it tested my patience. Still for the levels of wokeness I am used to seeing lately in AAA titles, I can say that this was within my tolerance threshold, it could have been worse. And again it's a cyberpunk title, everything is very heavily sexualized. There is a lot of sexual deviancy in general so this is kind of fitting at least to some extent, so I'm willing to forgive it. Another related thing that annoyed me was that a character which would have made a much better fit for my V was out of the question since she was lesbian. And that's something that I, I didn't understand again, why just not make, if you want to make things so woke in that aspect, just make literally every character be available for gay relationships. 
relationships. Now imagine you meet a male character, right? And if you're a male guy, the character should have, I, I think that that's how it was in games like in Mass Effect, where the gay, the gay characters at some point offer you a speech check, which has like heart on it. It's pretty obvious what this is about. And you just tell them to fuck off and the game knows, okay, this guy's not gay, with, doesn't want to fuck with this character. So we're not going to do it. And just give me every character, just have both options. That would be at least tolerable because then I can, you know, use my character to sleep with the chicks I want to sleep with in the game instead of having a bunch of chicks who my character is actively flirting with and they're like looking at you and literally friend zoning you saying things like oh V don't go there let's not do that let's not ruin our friend no I want to ruin my friendship I want to ruin this friendship let's ruin it but no the game won't allow me so anyway, you've probably noticed that I have been listing things that bothered me a lot up to this moment. Well, not necessarily a lot, but mostly things that bothered me. I decided to start with those because there are a few of them. Now, the time has come for me to address the things that I would consider this game's strengths. Let's talk about world building. Cyberpunk 2077 is hands down the best depiction of a cyberpunk dystopian future which I have ever seen. Both Night City and its outskirts are full of details worth exploring. Naturally the focus is on the city itself with its various districts, but besides the many side and main quests, you can also find hidden side activities which will not appear on your map at first and will instead trigger when V enters specific areas or talks to particularly interesting people. There are plenty of videos which showcase the many secrets Night City has in store and it's honestly a huge treat for any completionist who has just finished all the possible missions that are available on the map, including the side missions, and is wondering what to do next because he doesn't want the game to end. Another amazing thing is that every vehicle in the game has an interior and they all look awesome. In fact, I found them so cool that I refused to use any other camera with the exception of the first person one. That's the one for me because of the cool interiors. And as with everything else, it didn't take too long for me to get used to it. After which I was just as good at driving from the first person perspective as I had been when using the third person one. The game's music is between good and great. When you drive, there are several radio stations between which you can switch and they all have different music types. To be honest, I found many of the songs to be quite bad but there are still a few winners in there, some of which I enjoyed so much that I actually had to find them outside the game and I still listen to them when doing other things than playing Cyberpunk 77. The game's voice acting is fantastic, obviously this is a AAA title, so everything is voice acted by seasoned professionals. This helps you connect emotionally with your character as well as with Johnny Silverhand who joins us early on in the story. And since I've mentioned him, let's talk about Keanu Reeves and his performance. As someone who considers The Matrix to be his favorite action movie of all times, you could say that I generally like Keanu Reeves. But the thing about him is that if you have seen him act once, you've pretty much seen the entire acting range of this man. He has made a career of acting a single role himself. He's either one of the worst actors I can think of or one of the best when it comes to picking his roles. Even when you consider my very critical opinion of him, which I have just stated, I still found his mostly monotonous and typical performance to fit really well with the role of Johnny Silverhand. In the words of the incredible Todd Howard of Bethesda, it just works. Your interactions with Johnny are important. Depending on some of your choices, you can even unlock a secret ending with him. And my V ended up being best friends with Johnny. By the end of the game, he and I were bros. For my second playthrough, I wanted to try something different and be an asshole to him from start to finish. Believe it or not, this felt so wrong that I simply ended up being best friends with him again. That is how you make a good character. Sadly, the game doesn't do such a good job with all of its characters. Jackie is a prime example here. We meet him at first during one of V's life paths. The game then proceeds to play a montage which shows us that our protagonist and Jackie are really good friends and close business partners. The problem here is the same as the one we've had with the life paths as a whole thing. Rather than telling us all of this in a montage, I would have preferred if they had allowed us to play it instead. 
I can understand that asking for more missions and more time in order to bond with characters is no small thing to request, but in this case I feel like this would have really improved the game. Since I've touched upon it a few times, let's talk about Cyberpunk 2077's story. Since the story develops quite quickly and presents its first twists very early on, I will do something unusual and actually skip it and talk a bit about its endings instead. But fear not, no spoilers will be given. I know you're probably wondering how that's gonna work but just bear with me. I do want to praise the game for its multiple endings, all of which feel very different. The truth is that at least at this point there's no canonical ending. Any of them could be considered to be the correct one. There are several important points in each of them and they all feel like it could be what really was meant to happen. To me personally, the ending which most tend to describe as the bad ending feels like the most interesting and fitting of them all. Ultimately it will be left up to the player, but let this much be said, they are all awesome and should be experienced, especially considering the fact that unlike in many other games where an ending is just like a cutscene that plays for 5-10 to 10 minutes, the endings in Cyberpunk feel like substantial deviations from the story which take well, up to hours really, so you should definitely try to play as many as you can. Which isn't made hard because the game warns you when there's the moment, you know, the point of no return, so you can just put a save there and make some different choices. And you will be able to experience most of the endings this way. Now it's time to talk about the game's missions. The side content here is quite good, with some missions having stories which were just as interesting and exciting as some of the main ones. Each district of Night City has its own fixers who will provide us with more and more missions. Doing these will ensure we are flush with cash, which can then be spent on things such as implants, weapons and my personal favorite, cars. When it comes to those, you can steal whatever you see provided you have the necessary stats, because there is a stat check involved, but those stolen vehicles don't become yours. If you want to own a car and thus have the ability to call it to your location at will, you will have to do jobs for fixers and they will periodically offer to sell you some cars. On rare occasions you will also get rewards in the form of a car. The missions allow for a lot of flexibility, in almost all cases you can approach a task however you like. If you have to enter a place you can usually do so in different ways, each of which adapted to a certain playstyle. You could hack a terminal or just use brute force for example. In addition to that you can also choose between stealth or a more direct approach, although stealth is usually rewarded with extra funds. And speaking of stealth, I remember a friend of mine telling me that this game cannot be played stealthily. This is obviously not true, however I am willing to agree that the stealth in Cyberpunk 2077 is more challenging than in most other games of this kind. In order to remain unnoticed, you most certainly have to incorporate quick hacks into your playstyle which is the ability to hack things and people from afar. This is particularly useful against robots and other security systems such as cameras, but don't forget we are in a dystopian future where everyone has implants, so people in essence are also in many ways machines because they use cybernetic optics and all kinds of cybernetic implants, so you can turn these off as well for great results. I ended up enjoying the stealth gameplay a lot and would sometimes even challenge myself by trying to take out every hostile within the area without ever being noticed. Something I used to love doing in the Hitman series by the way. Of course, a more direct approach is also available, here we can choose between melee or ranged weapons and both are fun and rewarding to use, though for me melee was the cooler option. The point that I'm making is that no matter what fits your tastes, all of this is fun and there are no wrong choices. You know sometimes when you play RPGs, you think to yourself, okay I gotta pick perks, I gotta pick weapons, I gotta pick a class, I want to pick something that's gonna be strong because sometimes there are some classes that are kind of duds and some classes that are extremely overpowered later on. That's not the case here, everything can be extremely overpowered later on. And since I've mentioned them, let's talk about perks. Honestly I was a bit disappointed here. It felt like a lot of them are simply not very good, more so than in other games. This could just be me though. In any case, there are lots of points to unlock and if you should change your mind, you can easily reset them. Just costs a bit of money. As I've mentioned before, there is a lot to do outside of the actual missions. You can even play a fun arcade game revolving around the Witcher Geralt's horse. I spent way too much time with that one. Naturally you could also choose to roleplay as a cyber psycho and go on a murdering rampage. I mean, who wouldn't enjoy being chased by the police a bit like back in the good old GTA days? 
Sadly, this is where Cyberpunk failed to provide a fun experience. The police will simply spawn around you, which not only breaks immersion, but also isn't really fun. I guess this was done to discourage the player from standing his ground, particularly the special max stack unit can do a lot of damage if you are not careful, but create a bottleneck and their stupid AI will stand no chance against you, even if they outnumber you vastly. I mean, why make them spawn around you like that? Can't they spawn somewhat further and rush you then? Or rather, can't they arrive in the flying vehicles they are supposed to and rappel down or something? I don't know. Anyway, let's talk about the anime and the recent Steam Award controversy. The anime called Edge Runners was really decent. While I would not call it a masterpiece, it was definitely enjoyable and more importantly faithful to the source material. Pretty much every location in it can be found in the game and you will be thinking to yourself, hey I've been there, hey I've seen this and this is kinda cool and if you haven't, that's alright as well because it will be the other way around. As soon as you start playing the game later, you'll be like, hey this was in the anime. Another great thing for me is that there is no woke shit shoved down our throats and it tells a story which while completely disconnected from the games is still compelling and absolutely in tune with the cyberpunk 2077 atmosphere and source material. They even use all of the future expressions introduced by the game such as Tomb and Gonk which at first confused me a lot because I just thought hey I never heard these words, but then realized that this is just future lingo. I can recommend you watch it because I believe that it will enhance your overall experience with the game. Now to the Labor of Love award on Steam. To those of you who don't know, the Labor of Love award is given to a game which has been out for a while yet still receives regular updates and even new content. In my personal opinion, service games such as Apex Legends, League of Legends, or even MMOs like Black Desert don't really count since they need to provide new content at a steady trickling stream in order to keep people hooked and generate revenue. This award is designed more for games which you pay once and play through. These awards are given by the players themselves with votes. The community has decided that Cyberpunk deserves it based on how much the game has improved in these past months. I can see how some people can be upset by it since it's fair to say that releasing a literally broken game and then essentially fixing it within the next two years in order for it to be in the shape in which it should have been at the start is not labor of love, but rather a simple completion of a contract. And I would fully agree with it had the game simply been made to work as intended, but the updates did so much more. We actually got lots of additional content, which is more missions, new items, new apartments for V, etc. There has been stuff continuously added. We've seen a lot more than simple fixes under the hood and it is appreciated. This is also why this award is earned fairly in my opinion. Yes, CDPR fucked up with that whole greedy big company thing they did. But remember what made them into one of the most respected game developers before the initial cyberpunk disaster hit. I think that they have remembered as well. I want to believe that this was a wake up call for them and things will now be going in the right direction. One of my biggest fears after beating the game was that they have crafted this awesome game universe and this awful launch for which they carry full responsibility might end up killing this otherwise fantastic franchise. Luckily my fears were dispelled when I read that both a huge expansion and a sequel are both in the works. Meaning that City Project Red have not given up on Cyberpunk just because they fucked up. At the end of the day, I've had tons of fun with Cyberpunk 2077. To me, it is hands down the best game in the Cyberpunk genre up to this date. It is one of those games that sadden you when you finish playing because it was such an enjoyable journey. No matter how long it takes you to reach the end, it will always seem like it was too soon. If you haven't played it, do yourself a favor and get it. Just be patient, it starts a bit slowly in terms of the story and may seem overwhelming at first with all of the quick hacking mechanics, but trust me, once you pass that threshold and you start understanding the game a bit better, you will be addicted to the awesome presentation, fun gameplay loop and great story which will be provided to you in Cyberpunk. With that having been said, I want to thank you for watching Game Filter. If you would like to support my channel, upvote and leave a comment that really helps. You could also check out my Patreon, the link to which you will find in the description of this video. I hope this review has been informative and would love to see you again next time. Until then, have a great day. This is Nino, signing out.